What on earth is this thing? Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue discussing the topic of electronic filters by looking at some other types of components that can be used for this purpose, namely piezoelectric based components. Now although most filters are built around the basic passives, resistors, capacitors and inductors, and well basic active amplification elements, in certain cases these will not be sufficient. In general, when very high Q factor and small size is needed, filters can be built from either piezoelectric crystals or ceramics. DC wide use from relatively low intermediate frequency filtration up to the UHF and above in bandpass applications. And usually all of these come in very small packages. So the fundamental piezoelectric effect can be used as a way to directly interface between an electrical wave and the mechanical wave. When a electric potential is applied to the piezo material, this will change its physical size, either increasing or decreasing it, a phenomenon which is used to create useful things like piezoelectric speakers. But this is also something that shows up in unwanted places, like with ceramic capacitors, which end up buzzing when large amplitude pulses are applied. And this material property can also be used the other way around, so when an external mechanical force is applied to the piezoelectric material, an electric potential is created. One use case for this is the lighter. So here, an impact applied to a piezoelectric crystal generates a momentary spark needed to, well, light the lighter. The final ingredient to remember about the mechanical world is resonance. Based on the physical dimensions of a material and the exact composition, a resonance frequency can be determined. The object will easily oscillate at this frequency while resisting oscillation at any other frequency. Putting everything together, piezoelectric filter components rely on two fundamental modes of operation. Either you have a two terminal component which presents a minimal impedance when the applied signal frequency matches the mechanical self resonance frequency, like in a two terminal quartz crystal, or you can generate the mechanical wave at one side of the crystal. And based on various propagation properties, you can transform it back to an electrical signal on the other side. This is the way something like a saw filter works. Now, this is not a particularly interesting component from visual point of view. However, this antique delay line is. So even though this is technically not a filter, I think this is still a quartz crystal that relies on generating the mechanical wave at one end and after it bounces a bit around, it gets reconverted into an electrical signal at the other end. So it relies on the exact same operating principle. Based on the exact component and its internal complexity, various equivalent electrical models can be created. However, today I will focus on the basic two terminal implementations. Crystals can either be used as standalone filter elements in things like oscillators, or in multi-element ladder filters for signal processing. But to get the desired effect, sometimes a bit of fine tuning is needed. And to get this done correctly, knowing the internal equivalent schematic is also helpful. So the basic equivalent model of a crystal contains a set of RLC components in series, as well as a parallel capacitor. Now, these are not real components inside of the crystal, but rather their equivalent circuit shows a similar behavior to the real thing. Because of this arrangement, you get two distinct resonance frequencies, a series and a parallel resonance. So the series resonance occurs between L1 and C2 in this model, and the parallel resonance occurs between L1 and the equivalent series capacitors formed by C1 and C2. So the capacitance present in the parallel circuit is smaller, therefore the parallel resonance frequency is always higher than the series resonance frequency. Last thing that is important to mention about a crystal is the main reason it's widely used in filters, the specific Q factor that can be achieved. So if you know the values of the characteristic parameters, if you don't you can find various online resources on how to measure these, I also covered this in some older videos, then you can also calculate the Q factor to get an idea of what sort of filter can practically be built. So just an example, the results I got from some practical crystals highlight the extremely high Q factor values that can be obtained. In general, a typical inductor capacitor filter will be limited to values of Q factor of around a few hundred. 
but with crystals, you can get Q-factor values well into the tens of thousands. So just to confirm the behavior, we can try out some circuits in the circuit simulator. So I've taken some of the component values that I've measured for a 20 MHz quartz crystal and put them in the arrangement of the crystal's equivalent model. So firstly, we can observe the impedance by using a current source in a AC type of simulation. So the exact impedance of this entire structure will be the voltage in the incoming signal node divided by the current, which is one. So if we run the circuit and we look at this voltage and we plot out on a logarithmic scale, we can clearly see our two resonance frequencies. So we have a point of minimal impedance and a point of maximum impedance. And we can confirm to which resonances these correspond by extracting the components that we expect are part of this resonance. So for the series resonance, we expect it to be based on the series components, the series RLC circuit, and the two frequencies nicely line up. And for the other resonance, I just put the two capacitors in series, and this is in parallel with the inductor. And for this, the resonance frequency corresponds with our second resonance. Now, the amplitude is different because of the different arrangement, but the frequencies nicely line up. So by doing this sort of separated model, the two resonances can be isolated. Now, when you measure a crystal, you can observe the series and parallel resonance quite easily. So I performed these measurements using a light VNA on an 8 MHz crystal and also on a 455 kHz ceramic resonator. So both of these graphs line up really nicely with the theory and equivalent model. So even though one is a crystal and the other a ceramic resonator, they both exhibit the same general behavior. But when the measurement zooms out a bit, you will notice so-called spurious resonances. So other than the fundamental resonance, both in the case of the ceramic resonator and the case of the crystal, you also get these secondary resonances at higher and lower frequencies. This is perfectly normal, but usually the basic model will ignore this. However, if you want to model this sort of behavior as well, the equivalent circuit will look a bit more complex and be built from multiple sets of RLC resonance circuits, all of them lined up in parallel. So for this particular circuit, this is what the impedance result looks like. Point is that if your real filter is letting some unexpected signals through, it might be from these various resonances. Now, in real life, the crystal isn't perfect and neither is the surrounding environment. So to some extent, you will not rely on the base resonances, but rather you will want to adjust the behavior ever so slightly to get the specific desired effects. Now, in general, to adjust the resonance frequency of an LC resonator, you need to change the value of the components. With the basic crystal, we have four main things that we can do. Either add capacitors or inductors in series or in parallel. So let's start looking at the various cases one by one, starting with the series capacitor. This component should be in series with the series resonance circuit. So if we run the simulation and first of all, look at our reference and compare it to our circuit with the series capacitor, we can see that our series resonance has moved to a higher frequency. So this is because the two capacitors in series are forming a smaller value than before. And this does not change the parallel resonance. Now, in a similar fashion, when we add a series inductor, this again should affect the series resonance, since this is in series with the series RLC circuit. And when we look at the impedance of this structure, we can see that our series resonance has moved to a lower frequency. So the total inductance is now larger than it was before. Now, if we do want to affect the parallel resonance, we need components to be added in parallel with our initial circuit. So starting off with a circuit with a parallel capacitor, if we look at the impedance of this structure, we can see that adding the capacitor in parallel has moved the parallel resonance to a lower frequency. And well, in a similar fashion, if we now add a parallel inductor, this moves the parallel resonance to a higher frequency. And well, in both cases, the series resonance has remained unaffected. So a crystal's resonance frequencies are not really set in stone, but rather they are variable based on what exactly is on the outside of the component. Now, although you can change the resonance frequencies, 
there are a few limitations to keep in mind. First, after you add your series or parallel impedance, the series resonance always needs to be at a lower frequency than the parallel resonance. Adding ever larger values could just lead to a situation where the behavior becomes unreliable. The other thing to remember is the whole reason for using the crystal in the first place. The high degree of accuracy in the observed behavior. By adding external components, these come with their real-life limitations. Real components come with ESR, which will reduce the overall Q factor, and then you also have the value instability. The stability of the crystal parameters is usually measured in parts per million, whereas inductors and capacitors usually have units to tens of units of tolerance percentage. So adding external components to change the initial crystal parameters will come with the price of reducing the precision of the final resonance frequencies. So the impact of the external components should be kept to a minimum. In general, even though it is possible to adjust the resonance frequency of a crystal, this is limited to small values. The external components, together with the various environmental parasitics, are used together to get the final target behavior. And well, in general, the value inscribed on a crystal can only be achieved by adding a certain amount of external reactants. Finally, I want to highlight the two main building blocks for crystal-based filters. So most crystal filters are bandpass filters, and you can use the crystal component either in a pi or in a T type of configuration. So the crystal is either in series or in parallel. However, the most common implementation is the pi or series type. Now, the main difference between these two is when exactly the bandpass effect occurs. So if we simulate the two circuits, and we look at the output signal, we can observe that for the pi implementation, so the one in blue, the passband is at a lower frequency, so at the crystal's series resonance. Whereas with the T filter, it's at a higher frequency, so at the parallel resonance. Now, if this amount of attenuation is not enough, and you want higher amounts, you can build higher order filters, with multiple of the fundamental blocks. So, just as an example, I prepared two crystal T circuits and two crystal pi circuits. If we look at the responses and plot them on the same graph, first of all, we can see that the passband frequencies are more or less in the same place, and the attenuation is much higher than with the single crystal circuits. So multiple crystals can be put into the circuit to obtain higher and higher amounts of attenuation. Now, the other thing to mention is the expected bandwidth and Q factor from the complete filter. The main mechanism by which you can adjust this is by changing the interconnecting impedances. So to get a very tight, small bandwidth, the filter needs to be connected to very small impedances. And well, to get very wide bandwidths, the filter should be connected to larger impedances. So if we just check these circuits, we can see that at least for the two T-type implementations, there is a very clear difference in the bandwidth. And if we check the pi implementations, again, a similar story. Now, there is however a limit to the exact bandwidth that can be obtained. First of all, the internal resistance of the crystal will limit the minimum bandwidth, but will also dictate the insertion loss. And while the reactive components will limit the maximum bandwidth. In general, this sort of ladder filters are usually limited to a maximum bandwidth of a few tens of kilohertz and the minimum bandwidth of a few tens of hertz, based on the exact components and the interconnections. In the end, any crystal-based filter is limited by the available components. You can only build filters around the frequencies for which components are available on the market. Regardless, quite a lot of different frequencies can be covered, and in general, with a bit of signal processing, you can do more or less anything that you want. So next time, I will look at some practical filter design tools, but also analyze some circuits I've built to see how they behave. And with that said, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.